like and how do you navigate that process? I'm so grateful here that at Evangelistic Center that pastor has allowed a space for those who feel that call on their lives and, and we can help them. Basically, it's just helping them to humanly cope with the godly call. Everybody did not finish the process and, and that's okay, but I'm proud of the ones that did. It was a year long process. They put in the work, they put in the time and I'm just glad to be a part of their, their journey, a part of their story and I could not have done it without uh, DC and without Tiana. So we just thank them and we thank Pastor for uh, creating this space for us to do that. With my hands lifted up And my mouth filled with praise With the heart of thanksgiving I will bless thee, O Lord With my hands, with my hands lifted up And my mouth filled with praise Hallelujah with the heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. Y'all keep singing. I will bless thee, I will bless thee, O Lord. O Lord, I will bless thee, O Lord. With the heart of thanksgiving, I will. I will bless thee, oh. Come on, let's say it again. I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh. Lord. oh. I will bless thee, oh Lord. Come on, say it, church. With my heart of thanksgiving, With my heart of thanksgiving I will. I will bless thee, oh Lord. One more time, say, I will bless thee. With the heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. One more time, one more time. Oh, say, I will bless thee. I will bless thee. With the heart of thanksgiving, yeah. I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh Hello, everybody. First, I want to start with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you have made for this opportunity to be in front of your people to release this word that you have given me. I pray over myself, over Christian and over Kenyatta, and I speak your confidence, I speak your strength, and I speak your power over us. I pray against all fear, and I thank you for the peace that you're bringing us as we present your word. We welcome the Holy Spirit's presence and his guidance. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Have you all heard that song that says, rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you? I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. It is a song out right now that I listen to quite frequently by Maverick City. The whole song talks about building a life on Jesus, how he won't fail us, standing strong on him and Christ being our firm foundation, our rock on which we stand. We can look at Luke 6, 47 to 49, in the New Living Translation, it says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it was well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Can I ask the question today? Have you built your life on Jesus, the rock, the firm foundation? 
Today, I am going to speak to you about our firm foundation. I will tell you about what it is, the importance of having a firm foundation, and some examples in my life where having a firm foundation helped me. The dictionary defines foundation as the basis or groundwork of anything or the lowest load-bearing part of a building, typically below ground level. Let's take a look at a physical house and its foundation. What would happen if the foundation was not firm? It would fall, it would shift, and it would not last. In August of 2000, the house next to my parents' house where I was living, it exploded. Nobody got hurt, and there are so many God moments and testimonies involved with that day, but that is for a different, a different day. What I want to highlight today is that when the insurance adjuster came to look at my parents' house to see what the rebuilding was going to look like, he said, the foundation is still good and we can rebuild from that. That was a huge blessing for my parents to hear because they didn't have to rebuild the whole house. Because the foundation was still solid, it was firm that the rebuilding would happen from that. This is a physical picture of what is stated in Luke 6, 47 to 48. A storm came and our situation, the explosion. But the house stood firm because it was well built. Just like in the story I mentioned above, our house, ourselves, we have to be built on a firm foundation, on a solid rock on Jesus Christ. Again, in Luke, if we look at that first sentence, it says, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. Jesus gives this message to the people at the Sermon on the Mount and lets them know that he wants us to come to him. He wants us to listen to his teaching and then follow it. This is what will build a firm foundation. When we have a firm foundation, the storms can come, but like you heard in the story I mentioned above, your foundation will be good. And you can rebuild from that if needed, or it won't even touch your house because you are firm in the foundation of Jesus Christ. To build that foundation with Jesus, with God, with our Father, we are to be in our word daily. Reading the word exposes the heart of Jesus, his love for us, and being close to him in the word allows for the Father to speak and have intimate moments with us. If you have heard people say that when they are reading their Bible, it's like the words are falling off the page. In Hebrews 4.12, in the Amplified it says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. We can also look at John 1.1 1, 1 in the Amplified Version. It says, in the beginning before all time was the word Christ, and the word was with God, and the word was God himself. Both of these reveal that God is living, and because he is living and he is the word, then when we read his word, we get to encounter him, encounter Jesus Christ, and he will speak to us through the word by exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Like it says at the end of Hebrews 4.12, this lays the foundation of knowing him trusting him, following him, allowing him to mold us, and believing in him. We solidify a firm foundation in him. What is the importance of having a firm foundation? When we have the foundation of knowing God, trusting him, and believing in him, and that he is doing what is stated in Romans 8.28, in the Amplified Version, it says, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his plan mm -hmm. and purpose. When we know that and it is deeply rooted in us, then we can encounter the storms, the trials, and fall back on our foundation knowing that we have Jesus Christ and he is working together a plan for our good for us who love God. This foundation is unshakable and it provides what we need during the tough times and even in good times. Let me give you an example. Last May, 2023, my oldest daughter, Sabrina, came home after being gone for three years. Amen, amen. And it was amazing to have her back. It was joy to my ears to hear her laugh again. And I gave all the glory and honor to God for bringing her back, and I still do. What the enemy was trying to do was shake up my foundation by reminding me of the years that were lost at the precious moments that were missed during those years. And he was trying to cause a division in my family. During that time, I felt God calling me to be consistent in reading my word daily and to seek him daily. I would read his word prior to this, but not consistently and not how he wanted. June 2023, I committed to doing this daily and gave God my surrendered yes. I saw where he was giving me the ability to fight back with his word. He was showing me how to stand firm on his word and it was in my heart. So when the attacks came, I had his word in my heart and the attacks didn't hit like before. You see, this time was a huge answer to so many prayers that many people and I prayed for. We prayed for Sabrina to come home, and she did. I was literally sitting, standing, walking in my answered prayers, and the enemy was mad. This situation allowed me to recognize that I don't have to wait until the attacks come. I can be on the offensive side. I can strengthen my foundation always, and especially when I'm not in a trial. I can read the word daily, I can pray and fast when I'm praising him and not asking for anything. I can be built up even more to do what he has called me to do and hear him more precisely as my relationship with him continues to grow. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, in the Amplified it says, for we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. You are God's cultivated field, his garden, his vineyard, God's building. If I sat in the sorrow and grief that the enemy wanted me to sit in, if I didn't stand on my firm foundation and continue to strengthen it, I wouldn't have grown in him, and I definitely wouldn't be standing here today. This is the importance of having a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. Now, for time purposes, I am going to give you a bullet list of the examples of how Having a firm foundation has helped me. Okay. Um, My oldest daughter struggling with depression, cutting, and suicidal ideation. Yeah. My firm foundation. Marrying the person that I wanted to marry and then going through divorce and healing from abuse in that relationship. My firm foundation. Oh. My oldest daughter and grandson getting in a car accident, her being life lighted to Mercy Joplin, fracturing her pelvis, lots of glass in her arm, recovery for two months my firm foundation, quitting my corporate job per God, not working for four months, then following God's will to a job that paid half of what I was making, wow. my firm foundation, trusting God for two years while at Starbucks during COVID, my firm foundation, rebuilding the relationship with my youngest daughter, my firm foundation, purchasing a house in Kansas City, Missouri per the Lord and believing that he would provide to purchase it my firm foundation, trusting God that he would bring my oldest daughter back home even when it took three years, my firm foundation, rebuilding the relationship with my oldest daughter, my firm foundation, learning how to receive all that God has for me, showing up as who he has called me to be and hearing from the Lord more consistently, my firm foundation, hearing the Lord say to sell my house, give away all my things, and move back home with my parents and oldest daughter, my firm foundation. Wow. 
In Isaiah 54, 17, in the King James Version, it says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt, not con thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The weapons formed against me, but they did not prosper. The Lord fought for me. He protected me. He guided me. He trusted me. And he has called me. He is my firm foundation. Today, I went over what is a firm foundation, the importance of having a firm foundation, and some examples of how having a firm foundation has helped me. I pray that you have heard what the Lord wanted you to hear, that you received what the Lord wanted you to receive, and that if you haven't made the decision to have him as your firm foundation, to be your Lord and Savior, that you decide that today is the day to receive him. Thank you, and God bless you. Every heart that is broken And great are you, Lord You give life See, you give life You are love You bring life Let's lift our hands and declare that you give hope, you restore every heart. We all say, great are you, Lord. We decree and declare, it's your breath in our lungs. And so we pour out, we pour out of God. In our lungs, so we pour so we out our pour breath. Out our praise to you, we say it's the breath of God in our lungs, so we pour out. We pour out our praise in our lungs, so we pour out. We decree this right here. When all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will say, we see great high you, Lord. We say all the earth will say, all the earth will shout your our hearts will cry, our yeah. hearts will cry, we all say great. Church decree and declare that all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts require you say, and all the earth will shout your our hearts will cry. Our hearts will These bones will sing. Are you Lord say again with great expectation? We say all the earth will say. Great. We are the creator. 
say great are you lord yeah are you lord yeah again decree all the earth will say our hearts will cry these bones will say we all say great are you we all say great are you we say lord Before we get into the word, let us bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you speak through me on today. Give us an ear to hear and an our heart to receive. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Again, that is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. In the King James Version, it reads as follows. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me start off by saying there is so much to unpack within this one scripture. However, for the sake of time, my focal point will be part A. The New Living Translation reads, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a person by changing the way you think. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of, her, of his word. Today, I'd briefly like to speak on the subject of Christians and a cancel culture. Let me begin by giving an introduction or even a review of the terminology of cancel culture. Cancel culture is an increasingly more common term heard today. However, what exactly does it mean? It is defined as a culture in which those who are considered to have acted and or spoken in an unacceptable way as to cause individuals to be ostracized, boycotted, or shunned. To take away communication and support, whether socially or professionally, for an individual and their career, popularity, and or fame because of something they said or done that is considered unacceptable. Majority of those who have been canceled have received public backlash following accusations of violence, sexism, racism, homophobic or transphobic activities or comments. Canceling or canceling someone has not been around forever. It first appeared in a disco breakup song written by Niall Rogers in 1981 called Your Love is Canceled. Thereafter, the statement was used in the dialogue of a 1991 film entitled New Jack City. The line in which the main character, Nino Brown, also known as Wesley Snipes, 
During the film, Nino's girlfriend has an emotional breakdown due to his gang activities, therefore causing him to break up with her saying, cancel this young lady, I'll buy another one. Now, I've revised a few of the words to remain appropriate, <laughs> amen? <laughs> As we move forward with today's lesson, let us be reminded that there is nothing new under the sun. The terminology of the cancel culture might be new. However, removing individuals due to broken societal rules has existed for quite some time. Let's reflect on a few Bible influencers that would have been canceled today. First, there is Sarah, giving Hagar to be with her husband now, after Hagar conceived, Sarah became, became overwhelmed with anger, with hurt, and bitterness towards her, therefore throwing Hagar and her son into the desert with absolutely nothing to save them. She also struggled with a lack of faith when God promised that she and Abraham would have a son. For her mistreatment and her unpleasantries towards God and Hagar, Sarah definitely would have been canceled. Another influencer is that of King David. Now, King David was said to be a man after God's own heart. However, King David sinned as he committed adultery with another man's wife. When King David was informed that Bathsheba was with child, he tried to trick Uriah to leave the battlefront and come home to be with his wife. When Uriah refused, King David instructed to have him placed on the front lines of the war to have him killed for committing adultery with another man's wife and then having him murdered would earn King David a cancellation within today's society. Since the evolution of the internet and social media, what goes on the internet stays on the internet. Once it's on the web, it's always on the web. People are known to keep a record of wrongdoing of others. The most significant issue with the cancel culture is remembering. To, the definition of remember is to recall or to think of again, to keep in mind for attention or consideration, to retain in memory. The cancel culture thrives to remember the facts, the lies, the assumptions, the past events, experiences, and even the emotions that have occurred within someone's life. However, as Christians, as believers, we are instructed to keep no record of wrongs. Psalms 103 and 12 says, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Colossians 2 and 14 says, he canceled the record of the wrong, he canceled the record of the charges against us, took it away by nailing it to the cross. The punishable obligation due to our guilt of sins, shortcomings, mistakes, and our failures was removed when Christ was crucified. Therefore, no longer binding us or making us responsible for that which was committed. Now, although people, the internet, and the culture refuses to forget, Christ refuses to remember. Amen? <laughs> Another issue with the cancel culture is unforgiveness. The definition is unwilling or unable, having or making no allowance for error or weakness. Past instances of inappropriate or hurtful speech or actions, no matter how long ago, are not to be forgiven within the cancel culture. One of the biggest contradictions of this culture is that most people appreciate being forgiven. However, when the time comes for them to forgive someone else for a wrong committed against them, they have a difficult time extending forgiveness. Romans 3 and 23 reminds us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word of God instructs us to forgive, to pardon, to remit as an offense or debt, to treat the offender as not guilty. Colossians 3 and 13 says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Amen. Amen. To truly understand forgiveness, we must start by recognizing that all have been forgiven by God 
for innumerable offenses that, would that we would never be able to settle on our own. So refusing to forgive someone is being unjust to God, who himself has forgiven and is ready to forgive. True forgiveness provides an opportunity to glorify God and to exemplify the forgiveness we ourselves have received through Christ Jesus. Psalms 86 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. May we be more like Christ, merciful and having a natural response to extend grace and forgiveness. Within the cancel culture, there is also an eagerness to respond to speak the supposed truth and clap back, to retaliate to an insult with a much stronger comeback. Society cheers while others are humiliated on social media platforms. Spiteful comments are made to those hurting and hostile words are lashed out when individuals are offended. Believers, let us not forget that we are called to live differently. Ephesians 5 and 1 said we are to imitate the life of Christ and mirror the behavior of that which is popular, not popular, in culture. My question today, are we as believers responding or are we restoring? As believers, our focus should be restoration. 1 Peter 5 and 10 says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his etern eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Here Paul reminds us of the power of God and the temporary nature of our cancellations, our trials, and our suffering. It's clear that believers all over the world have and will face suffering but we are assured the suffering is only for a little while. Yeah. After our suffering, God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. Though the word after may cause us to believe that God is not working in our trials, that is not the sense of this verse. He will fully empower us to stand firm for him, even in the midst of our troubles. Unfortunately, when suffering, so many of us only see the suffering and not the loving God within the suffering. Mm. Suffering is a catalyst that forces us to move. It is impossible to go through suffering and remain unchanged. Mm -hmm. To find restoration through suffering, one cannot be tied to a specific outcome. Restoration is not that our situations will turn out a certain way, or that God will grant us exactly what we desire, but knowing that God will always do and provide what is best for us. Therefore, we can rejoice in our cancellations, knowing God is using them to produce in us what we cannot produce in ourselves. As I close, let us, remind it, let us be reminded that we have been forgiven to forgive. Therefore, let us always be found forgiving and restoring. Even in the momentary times of cancellation, be assured that you might be canceled, but you're still covered. And, and even in Christ's covering, we can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Come on and clap your hands. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never, ever be defeated. And because God, he is the greatest power, we shall never, never be defeated. Verse 1, I shall rise, I shall be, and I shall go in victory. No weapon formed 
against me will ever overtake me. Say, and because God, because God is the greatest power, the greatest power we, shall never, we shall never, never be defeated. Never be defeated. And because God, because God, with your power, Jesus, the greatest power we shall never, we shall never, never be Come on and sing it one more time. And because God is the greatest power, Jesus, we shall never, ever be defeated. And because God is the greatest power, Jesus, we shall Listen, huh. the devil is a liar, <laughs> and God is exalted. He'll never be defeated, oh, never be defeated. Let me sing it one more time. The devil is a liar, God is exalted, hey, and he'll never be defeated. No, he won't say he'll never be defeated. Say, the devil is a liar. That he's alive and he'll never be defeated. I said he'll never be defeated. I said the devil is a liar. I said he'll never be defeated. I said he'll never be defeated. Come on and lift it up. The devil is a liar. God is exalted.
never be defeated. Come on and sing it, no music. And because God. Thank you, Jesus. You never fail. Ever. There's never a day where you miss me. You got me covered. Just a quick word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you. Thank you Lord. Mm. You've been a great father. Mm. You've never failed. My God in heaven, thank you for life. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for keeping your people. And thank you for having the last say. And thank you for going before us. In Jesus' name, amen. As you can tell, I am a little nervous. <laughs> My name is Kenyatta King. You know, sometimes in life you have to make adjustments. Come on in here. <laughs> Come on now. So, my name is Kenyatta Kennedy, and uh, my title is I Believe God. Okay. My first scripture is Deuteronomy 1 and 30. It said, the Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he has did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Matthew 14 and 17 says, and 17 says, the word still speaks even when we're a little bit off. We get back on track. Come on now. And so um, Matthew 14 and 13. When Jesus heard of it, when they said heard of it, that means he heard about the beheading of John the Baptist. He departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities, which means they pressed beyond what they were going through. You know, life happens that way. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past and send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. Come on now. And he said, well he said, bring them hither to me, give it to me. Give me your shortcomings. Give me where you, where you fall short at, give it to me. Mm hmm Because you know what, what really what he does, I'm just, you know, sorry, my nerves. But really what he does is when you give him your shortcomings, uh, you may think it's shameful or your past or the mistakes that you make and the things that you go through. But when you give him your shortcomings, he repurposes it. And you give it to him and you release it to him. And then what he does is this, he's so much God that what he does is he now repurposes and broke. the Bible says that he looked to heaven, gave thanks, he broke it, then he uh, gave it back to them, which means he repurposed the pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My God in heaven. Oh my God, this is almost over. Um, <laughs> uh, but what he really does is this. You may give him your shameful moments, your disappointments, your past. And he said, well, give me your shame and let me repurpose it. And I'll give you back a ministry. Come on now. Let me give you your, mis give me your mistakes and watch me make it into a testimony. Just give it to me. Acknowledge where you are. Amen. So when I said I thank God for life, what happened was, uh, 2023, June the 14th, I woke up and my stomach was swollen like I was may maybe about nine months pregnant. I'm full figured and it's okay, but I was a little fuller that day. <laughs> and so I uh, couldn't, um, couldn't move my 
legs, my feet. So my sister gets me to the emergency room and I get back there and they're tending to me. Now the doctor and his assistant came in, God bless him. Ah, but the first thing that I noticed was like, my God, he's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I was sick, I wasn't dead. Come on now, <laughs> come on now. Amen, it's all right. So then immediately when I looked at the young lady, even in the midst of what I was going through, you know, life happens. And um, really, you know, sometimes what we really just got to think of it like this. The will of the Lord must be done, even in an inconvenient place. Hey, come on now. And so what happened was this. Immediately when I looked at her, even with all that going on, um, immediately God began to speak. Now, I don't know if anybody has ever had appendicitis, but that is very painful. And I want to acknowledge God today because I didn't have any pain medication in my system. And uh, actually, it even hurt to laugh. And so they get me off, you know, after God speaks, they get me off and they take a CT scan and they come back. And so what happens was this. I, my focus shifted when God began to speak because it was, I really wasn't certain of how this thing was going to turn out. But my concern was that God, that I speak what you gave me to speak. I did your will. And he didn't speak and say, Kenyatta, I'm going to do this if you just speak this. No, he spoke and that settled it. My God in heaven. Whew, my God. He spoke. And uh, he didn't bargain with me. See, that's called a relationship with the Lord. That doesn't happen overnight. That calls for a lot of crying and a lot of tears and a lot of mistakes. So you're going to make them. Just keep moving. If you're moving two inches at a time, baby, keep moving. Because you're going to get there because God said it. Amen? So then, after, I kept asking for the girl to come, to, him to send the girl back in. And uh, eventually they did. And I began to, you know, just tell her, you know, I had wisdom in how I said it. I wasn't spooky, you know, anything like that. I had wisdom, amen. Because some people don't know God. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. And so, uh, so what happened was, after all of that, after I had released the word that God had given me, um, I was no longer concerned about how this thing was going to turn out. I just wasn't. I, he didn't say, you know, can y'all going to be healed if you do this? No, sir. No, ma'am. He spoke. That was it. And I said, well, God, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So what happened was this. Um, he just, uh, I noticed that they kept rushing. They kept rushing, just kept rushing, rushing, rushing. I was supposed to be on the operating table at four o'clock. And they said, oh, you'll be out by six, you know, just a, yeah. And uh, so 1215, transportation came. They said, we're here to take you. And then I believe the doctor minimized it because he didn't want me to panic. So they get in there and uh, they said, listen, if we, if it ruptures while we're in here, we're gonna have to cut you the long way. And me trying to be tough, I said, well, just give me the paper sign and let's go. You know, mm -hmm. I was shaking. So I get in there and God has a sense of humor. And, uh, you know, they're talking to me and telling me, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Number one, I was high as 10 kites because they had given me something to relax me. Amen. 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 And so, <laughs> so what happened was, <laughs> uh, so what happened was, um, I started to ask questions and you know, it was kind of getting on the anesthesiologist's nerves or whatever. And she said, oh, she said, oh, well, he's getting ready to give you something to, uh, to relax you. And I looked over, I was like, well, my God, he's gorgeous as well. I said, well, okay then, okay. Yeah, you know, I kind of smiled and then just, you know, hey, went on to sleep, you know. So what happened was um, when they got in there, and that's why when I say I thank God for life today, when they got in there, they not encountered one thing, but they encountered three. And uh, they were rushing against time to get it out because it was at the point of rupturing. Oh, sorry. And so uh, they found something the size of a brick. So they had to hurry up and take that out. Then they had to take the appendix out. And then they was like, well, the, the lower intestine is inflamed. And they informed me after surgery that, um, that uh, What's gonna, what, it was a problem and uh, during surgery. 
uh, because if any one of those things had a rupture, it could have been fatal or you would have been very ill at the least. So now I just remember, and I'm closing with this, I just remember seven days prior I was in my prayer time. And I, the longer that I walk with the Lord, I've come to understand this. I don't always ask for things now. But I remember June the 7th, I was in my prayer time and I said, God, I'm not going to ask you for anything. I said, I just want to thank you. I said, you have been a great father to me. I just want to thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And, uh, and I kept saying, I said, you've always provided for me. You've never let the enemy walk off with the last lad. You always got me covered. You always got me. And so what happened was this. Seven days after that, I'm on the operating table. And I want to tell you something like this. Number one, obey God. Even when it's inconvenient, come on now obey God. You obey and leave the outcomes to God. God loves you and I love you as well. God bless you.